we're back tonight. We want to welcome you to our uh, Abounding Grace Church Family Chat, or better known as Bible Study. And so, God bless you, and uh, thank you for tuning in, and hopefully uh, it'll be very beneficial for us tonight. I feel like uh, the Lord's kind of given me a little insight to some things here, and I want to share it with you. And I know that uh, if you feel like I do, any word that I can get from God or any insight, especially in this hour, is so beneficial. And so we're going to pray that that happens to all of us here tonight and be a time of encouragement through the Word of God. And so let me make a couple quick announcements here, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, uh, we need you to subscribe to our podcast on the YouTube channel, AGN. TV. Amen. And uh, we want to make sure that you have other formats that you can uh, watch the services on. And so remember that it's our YouTube channel. It's a podcast. We call it a podcast on our YouTube channel, agn.tv. So uh, a lot of changes coming up. And speaking of changes, I want to let you know that you need to be watching your uh, emails. We'll communicate with you because uh, we do plan on making a change for this Sunday, and uh, so we want to announce it. Uh, we don't want to announce it online, but we do want to announce and let you know that you need to be watching for it and uh, looking for it. And if you don't hear from us by Saturday evening, then try to contact one of us, and we'll make sure that uh, uh, we get the information to you. And so we're excited about it, and uh, it's a new year. Here we are. And uh, we're, we're going to see what God's going to do. I'm excited about it. Amen. Let's be in prayer. Uh, a lot of churches are in a time of prayer and fasting right now. And so I want to encourage all of us to take a fast day and uh, fast. Or if you want to do more than that or uh, go on an extended fast, there's lots of different fasts out there. It's just a matter of doing something. And uh, normally when we put the church on an extended fast, we go from supper to supper or uh, however you choose to do it. So uh, a lot of people used to do it and just eat in the mornings, and that's where they would break their fast, or we call it breakfast, amen. So uh, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, if there was ever a time that we needed to be in prayer and communicating with God and seeking Him, I think it's in the hour that we live in right now, amen. I also want to commend you again for your support and your giving to the work of God, to the church, the kingdom of God. Uh, thank you so much for continuing to support it. And I know it's uh, uh, the economy is kind of crazy right now, but we're thankful for the blessing of God upon our families, our people, and uh, most everybody still has a job, and uh, we're glad for that. Amen. And so we want to thank him, and let's have a heart of gratitude. And let's be thankful for the blessing of the Lord and the hand of God upon the church and the, his people to uh, provide for them. Amen. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. So we're thankful for that promise. And in spite of what the economy is doing or the stock market or whatever, we know that's not our source. It may be uh, one of the ways that God gets us to us, but truly is our source. And so... Uh, we want to be reminded of that. And again, thank you so much for your faithfulness. And I encourage you to continue to give. Of course, you know the ways to give. And uh, you can go on the website or uh, whatever and uh, <clears throat> uh, give online. Amen. Or you can mail it to the office. Praise God. Some of you do that. And we're thankful. Amen. Anyway, we're thankful for it. All right. Uh, I think that's about all the announcements that I have. And uh, so we're going to kind of go on into the word of the Lord here just a little bit. And uh, I want to I want to read uh, I want to read uh, two different passages of Scripture tonight. First of all, I want to read uh, Genesis chapter eleven and verse number four. Genesis chapter eleven and verse number four. And they said, "Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven." And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. 
Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I want you to notice, uh, and uh, well, let's pray over this. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those that are watching and those that are participating through the scripture. Help me to be able to connect with people here uh, through this means and through technology. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Open our spiritual understanding, God, that your word do its intended purpose in our lives tonight. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus. And wherever you're at, you can say amen. All right, let's uh, let's look at this here, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> I want to talk to you tonight about um, well, a couple different ways to approach it, I guess. Uh, one would be about uh, which building are we going to observe. Another would be uh, um, plurality or singular. And I'll explain that here in just a second. If you'll notice in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, the statement is, and they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into the heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, <clears throat> I, I've used this passage before uh, in explaining, and I, I think just a few weeks ago, if I remember correct, I, I mentioned and I talked about uh, the two towers. Uh, this is the Tower of Babel that they're going to build. And the other tower in the Old Testament, of course, is the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run therein and is safe. So basically, what tower are you going to go to? Uh, it's very clear that Genesis chapter 11 is the beginning of something that would be referred to as mystery Babylon. It starts here, it, and when it says it's a mystery, it means it's veiled. Uh, and there's a time for it to be unveiled, but the mystery of it, you know, Paul talked about, others talked about the mystery of iniquity, uh, the mystery of godliness, uh, but yet God gives us insight into it. It's not something he wants to keep secret uh, forever, but yet he gives us the ability or discernment or uh, spiritual understanding to begin to see these things. So the scripture very clearly talks about mystery Babylon. It's all the way over to the book of Revelation. Now, of course, if you follow this, uh, Genesis chapter 11 is following immediate, immediately after Noah and the flood and God destroying the world with water. So, in Genesis uh, 11, you've got them saying, and go to. That's, that's something that's important. I've kind of overlooked that, but it says, go to. Let us build us a city. I've always just said, let us build a tower, but it actually says, let us build a city and a tower. Now, uh, I could talk about this, and it, it ties into, uh, well, I, I'll, get, I'll come down to that here in just a second. Amen. I want to, uh, I don't want to forget this, so if you just hang on a second, uh, I'm going to jot this down. All right, uh, so here it is, and I want you to notice in chapter 4, chapter 11, verse 4, I want you to notice how many times that the scripture refers to there, let us, let us, let us, let us. Uh, again, they've come from the flood. Uh, that's God's act of judgment against the world and the wickedness of the world. Uh, so now you've got humanity that are saying, okay, uh, we've been scattered, but let's go to, let's choose a place. Of course, they uh, chose the plain of Shinar. And so they get there and they're going to build this. And uh, they made bricks and they, they find the place. They have a vision. They have a purpose. Uh, they're, they're in unity. And that's, that's amazing to me. They're in unity. Even for an evil purpose, they're in unity. 
God even comes down and sees it and has to confound their language because he says, uh, nothing shall be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Even them trying to create a system or something in place that would keep them from experiencing my judgment or basically their, their thought was, okay, so if God floods the world again or if this flood comes, uh, then we'll have something that's built that's high enough above all this that uh, we can go to it and be safe. So you have in here the plurality of humanity coming together and basically saying we're going to create, we're going to build this tower, we're going to build this city, and this is going to be for our own salvation. So that way if you know Noah preached this crazy message that we needed to repent and you know, about this God that's going to flood the world. And so whatever and however they tried to explain it, but the fact is, is that they were very, very much about building this thing that would protect them, that they could escape God's judgment. They could escape any impending judgment that would be in the future. This is what they were thinking. And again, <clears throat> God speaks to them and he speaks and says, Nothing shall be restrained. Now, it shows you the power of unity is what it shows you. Uh, I, I mentioned this when we were talking about it. I, uh, uh, I was watching a, uh, a, a YouTube video of a rabbi, and he was teaching on, he mentioned these verses and got talking about brick and how that, it says they made brick. Now, a lot of the buildings uh, were built out of stone, some of them, very rough buildings and all, but uh, stone, any stone that was used, unless it was made into a brick or it was all chiseled down to certain dimensions to where everything was in conformity and it all looked the same, which basically is what they were using. So, uh, but a stone had different dimensions and the, the, their altars were built out of stone. A lot of the buildings there in Israel and all at this time, especially were built out of stone. Historians tell us that Jesus, his stepfather was a stone mason. So the deal is, but it didn't say that they took stones, but it says that they made brick. And of course, I was listening to, uh, I think it's Rabbi Lapin or Lapin, and he was talking about uh, that these bricks represents conformity and how that the world system that was trying to build this was trying to get everybody conformed to fit into this system, to fit into this building that they were doing so that uh, <clears throat> they would escape. They would create this uniformity. They had this unity. They were all in it together. This is what they wanted to do. So uh, I, I think that here again is the beginning of Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is very simple in the regard, or, or simply put is what I should say, in regard to the fact of it represents uh, humanity coming together, therefore the plurality, coming together to build something, to build a system that would, for them to be able to escape and to live in peace, to live in safety, and escape any uh, doom or any uh, thing that had just previously happened. So, uh, again, it starts there. It's all the way through the scripture, and we are definitely where we're at right now. And I just I don't want to spend a lot of time on this right here, but I think that we need to uh, kind of lay it out so people can understand. But what we're seeing is, is we're seeing this happen all over again, especially in the day that we live right now. We should be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. It's been around for a while. Uh, different uh, ages among the Gentiles has been about that. Uh, uh, a dominant one world, uh, one nation dominating over everybody else and, and uh, so on and so forth. But here again, and of course, Nebuchadnezzar's image and all this stuff. And then finally, the last beast that he sees, the last uh, of the kingdoms that he's seen, especially when it talks about his, the statue, Nebuchadnezzar's statue. 
uh, image. So we're kind of coming down to that right now, or at least I feel like we are. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know, I was trying to explain a little bit today to some others about, you know, we, we look at these things and we feel certain things, but we need to be careful when we just say, okay, uh, this is the way it is. This is the bottom line to it and all. But everything that we see right now is indicating, it's indicating that uh, Mystery Babylon is very active. So we're watching this deal uh, where society, the plurality, it moves more toward uh, uniformity and everybody, you know, being the same and uh, you know, let's build a system, let's build a city, let's build a tower, let's build a government, uh, let's build a world where that uh, any impending judgment, anything coming, uh, I think especially here after the pandemic, that the world is scrambling trying to find something that it could cause uh, mankind not to have to go through this again. And so... Uh, we can try to bring uniformity and it moves us even more toward uh, what some people would call globalization. And I hope I'm making sense and not just rambling here. Uh, I think that's where we're kind of at. This is my own personal view. I think that's where we're at. We're seeing these things beginning to happen. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, people building a city, building a city. Now, I, I want to come back to that here in just a second about building the city. And I, that's what I jotted down a while ago as a note. But I want to, I want to go from, from Genesis chapter 11 because the plurality of it. Let us, let us make a city or build a city and a tower. Let us come together. Let us go too. So here we have the plurality of it. Everybody coming together to build this, to create it, and uh, again to escape. Uh, God to escape any judgment. Uh, so now if you go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, the terminology is completely different. Now, <clears throat> Jesus says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I, I think it's important for us to look at where he was at when he said this and what it really represented because uh, this probably helps, and I, I'm sure most of you have already read this or studied it or seen it, but uh, I want to I tell you, this. there's a Caesarea that's over on the coast, and uh, there's a fortress there and all kinds, but this is a different place. It's Caesarea Philippi, and uh, I think according to my notes, uh, uh, it talks about... Uh, this is, uh, in the New Testament, this region denoted the northernmost extent of Jesus' ministry. Uh, our Lord could find some privacy here in this non-Jewish region with his disciples uh, because it was outside the domain of Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee and within the, within the area of Philip the Tetrarch. Shortly before Christ's final journey to Jerusalem where he would be crucified, upon entering the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his 12 disciples, who do men say that I am? So he comes to Caesarea Philippi. He's out of the reach of all this other stuff. And when he gets there, he turns to his disciples and says, who do men say that I am? All right. Now, of course, if you remember what the answer was, uh, who do men say that I am? And of course, uh, some said you're John the Baptist. Others said that you're Elias and all this, but this is what they're saying. This is what they're saying. And, um, you know, they, they gave a plurality of answers here. John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elias, or whatever. So, but he wanted to make it more personal. And he wanted to bring it down from them having some kind of a, uh, a plural answer. That to where it would come down to uh, something that was singular. So now he brings it down to this. But who do you say that I am? This is what other people say. They're trying to anticipate who I am. They've got their own views. You know, I heard years ago, somebody said the reason why they thought he was Jeremiah, because he'd weep over a city. 
The reason why they thought he was John the Baptist because he preached repentance. The reason why they thought he was Elias, one of the prophets, because he had miracles. Whatever reason was there is that they all had different answers, but they didn't see beyond the plurality of their answers the singular thing that he was. Now, Peter's going to get it right here. He said, uh, uh, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Now he's identifying who he is. Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed us unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. So he's, he's, he's letting them know the spirit has revealed this to you. God has revealed this to you. This is by divine revelation. This is by divine revelation. So let's, let's look at it here just a little bit. It almost seems like Jesus is deliberately setting himself against the background of the world's religions and all their splendor and glory, asking to be compared with them. Peter boldly replies with his great confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It's a, it's a statement of faith. Uh, it changes the whole dynamics for the disciples. And of course, you know, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Now he tells him, he said, now you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell, literally it means Hades, shall not prevail against it. Notice uh, here, now I'm going to say this and then I'm going to explain it to you. Uh, when he says, when he says the gates of hell shall not prevail, you have to understand exactly what all was taking place here the backdrop of what was taking place. Now, in Hellenistic period, the popularity of the God increased. We're talking about the Greek God, Pan. Uh, he became associated with the panic which could spread among soldiers in the heat of the battle. Yeah, pictures of him was, uh, yeah, he had the torso of a man, the, the face of a man, he had gold horns, and uh, the torso below, uh, his legs and all were that of a goat. And so, uh, of course, they thought pe people would exercise this, they'd worship this, and they thought if they worshiped this God, then he would basically uh, help them prevail. He would come through, this deity would come through against their enemy. Now, uh, there's a lot of different ideas about Pan and what it represented, but by Roman times, the God uh, became known as the All, a sort of universal God which was a play on the other meaning of the word pan. So it's here that Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Now, uh, the, the pagan mind, here's something that's important to the pagan mind, the cave, there were some caves at Caesarea Philippi, and there was a, a stream or a, a spring that was there and stuff and all, and you can go online and see pictures of all this, it's pretty interesting. Uh, it was there, it was there that these people believed because of the spring and because of all these caves and stuff, that this basically was the gate of Hades. It's where the underworld would come through into the earth. And this is where Pan come from and all these other deities and all these other gods come from. And so this, this is the backdrop. So when Jesus says upon this rock, I will build my church. There's some people that even believes that uh, there was a certain rock there that the spring flowed over and it was there by the caves and all this stuff that that's exactly what he was saying is. Now, look, you've always, everybody perceives this to mean that this is where Pan come from and all these deities from the underworld, they pass through here. This is the gate to Hades and this is a gate from Hades to the earth. He said, but it's on this rock, it's in this location, it's with this, that I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell, or in other words, Pan and all these other deities and all these other, the plurality of all these other gods are not going to prevail. I know we a lot of times talk about Hades being a place of death. It is the underworld. It's where they, everybody thought that those that died went to. But the fact is, Jesus is declaring here in the midst, watch this, in the midst of all the plurality. I mean, Pan, as I already said, he kind of has begun to represent a universal, all the deities universally, he began to represent it. So it's right there in that place of plurality that Jesus declares something very singular, or even Peter declares something very singular when he says, but thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So he identifies who he is. 
And then again, Jesus, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So right in the very heart of all the Greek mythology and all this stuff, Jesus is letting them know, I don't care how many gods you come up with. I don't care how many deities you come up with. Right here in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this plurality, I'm going to build, singularly build my church. Now, I know we could get into the deal where we're to help him and we're co-laborers and all that, but Jesus specifically said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, I think that's very important because when you go back to it, if you remember in Genesis 11, let us, let us, let us, let us uh, make, build a city, let us make a tower, let us. So you have the plurality of all this. It's humanity coming together and it's, it's all this uh, globalism and it's all the stuff that everybody's just going to come together and we're going to build this and all it's kind of like Caesarea Philippi with all their gods the plurality of all this but it's in the midst of all of that that Jesus declares I will build my church now if you'll remember also and this is the note that I made a while ago is that they said in Genesis 11 let us let us, let us make us a city, build a city, make a tower. Now, it's, it's, it's right after that that you start into the stories of somebody by the name of Abraham. And one of the things that God promised Abraham was, I want you to go and search and look for a city whose builder and maker is God. So you've got people over here trying to build a city, and then you've got God telling Abraham, I'll build you a city. I just need you to look for it. Now, we know when you get to the writing of Hebrews, it talks about Abraham uh, and, and his search and his quest. Let's just kind of turn over there, if you don't mind, and uh, read a little of that from Hebrews chapter 11. This is not in my notes, but it fits really good here. Uh, verse 8, Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go, out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob the heirs with him of the same promise watch verse 10 for he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God so we've got man trying to make a city, build a city. And we've got God over here telling Abraham, father of faith, I'm going to build a city. So you've got this, these two building projects. You got these two building projects. You've got man trying to build his own city, his own tower. And then you've got God saying, I'm going to build one. Jesus saying upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, Here's where I want to kind of start toward a conclusion with this is we have to determine which building we're going to focus on. And I want to say that again. We need to determine and we have to decide on which building we're going to focus on. In other words, you can get so focused and see all this other stuff over here. You can see them building their city. You can see all the stuff that was prophesied in the scripture. You can see uh, whatever, the spirit of the Antichrist, globalization. You can see all that, the uniformity of it. Let us make a city. Let us do all this. You can see all that, and you can get so focused on it that that's all you see. Or you can choose to turn away from all the plurality of this stuff, and you can turn over toward the singular fact of Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. So I think that we are going to have to choose. We're going to have to choose what we give our attention to. And I know I'm talking to a lot of people, even talking to myself. We're going to have to decide that I want to give my attention not so much to the other building over here from Genesis 11, Mystery Babylon, their city that they're going to build, 
we're watching it right now. The foundation's been laid, and they're building it. I don't think we've come to the completion of it, but we're, we're, we're seeing it. It is being built. We see it over there. It's being built. We see the same thing that God said. Nothing shall be restrained from them. The world's coming together. That's the message of the world. Let's come together in unity. That's the message of America right now. Let's put all this stuff behind us, all the violence behind us. Let's come together in unity. Let's be, you know, the one big happy family here. And so we're seeing all of that. We get so focused on it. We give all of our attention on that. And then we get to seeing it. And, it, and honestly, I think the more we focus on it, uh, it becomes a major distraction to us and we lose heart and we just kind of throw our hands up in there and say, what's the use? Uh, this has got to happen. This is the way that the end times got to unfold or, or we can look unto Jesus and see what he's doing and how he's building his church. Now, if I'm going to observe a building that's being built, I would rather go over here and focus on the church that Jesus is building instead of giving all my time over here to what they're building. Oh, it's going on. They're building it. But I can't afford to look under that and become distracted by that when I need to be looking over here on the other side and seeing the fact that Jesus said, I don't care if it is a pluralist, pluralistic society. I don't care how many things, I don't care how much that they're saying us and all that. I am going to build my church in the midst of all that. So it really, you know, here's the bottom line. It doesn't matter. And I say it doesn't matter. I know that people have concerns and stuff and questions and all. But it shouldn't matter so much about all this over here. Because we know that when Jesus stood there at Caesarea Philippi, with the backdrop, with the history of Caesarea Philippi. And he said there, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So to me, I think every spirit filled believer, you need to turn your focus on, okay, if he's building, I need to focus on that building. I need to participate in that building. I want to, I want to be a co-labor. I want to help. I want to get focused on that. I told my wife today, I said, I think it was today, I said, uh, look, here's the thing. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of crazy stuff going on, but um, if, if all this is going to take over and the church has no purpose left, then what are we doing here? I said, uh, I don't think God's just going to leave us behind and leave us in this so that he can beat us real good and pour his wrath out, out on us. So the very fact, I believe, that we're still here as the church is because there's a purpose for it, and God's not finished building the church, and God's not finished with the building project. And so, uh, you know, until that happens, God still has a purpose for us. He has a purpose for you. Uh, the deal is it's easy right now to lose heart, to get distracted, uh, you know, uh, people are distracted by the fact that, you know, pol politics and and parties and all this stuff and candidates and, you know, most Christians feel like how could all this stuff happen and all. But remember, it's God that sets it up, takes it down and all this stuff happening. But let's not get so focused on all that. Well, Brother Morgan, you know, you want us to bury our head in the sand. Well, no, I don't want you to bury your head in the sand. I just want you to decide that you're going to focus on God's building the church and you're going to, you're going to see that. And that's going to be again, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's God that builds all this except the Lord build the house. They that build labor in vain. So you know what? I want to look to what God's building in my life. I want to look to what God's building in abounding grace. I want to look to what God's building in, in the church in general, the, the global church. I want to look and see those things and what the Spirit's doing, what the Spirit's saying, the work of God, uh, the fact that we're about to be seated in some heavenly places, that God still has a purpose, that God still has a plan. So I'm encouraging all of us not to lose heart 
and not to get down and depressed and argumentative and ugly and all the stuff and all. But the deal is, is let's, let's look at the right thing. Let's focus on the right thing. Let's see the right thing. So if I have to choose which building that I want to observe being built, I don't want to get over here where evils looks like it's getting by and all this stuff's going on. I want to turn my attention over here and I want to focus on the fact. And I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like Abraham. Let's listen to the rest of this and I'll hurry to a close. For he looked for a city which had foundation, whose builder maker is God. The, uh, through faith, uh, also Sarah received strength to conceive seed, was delivered and with a child when she was past the age, being uh, because she judged him faithful who had promised, therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. But the deal is, let me find it here. Uh, it talks about if he had been mindful he would have returned talking about Abraham. If he would have been mindful or these people would have been mindful that they would have returned return unto what? Well, the whole deal there is, if you look at it there, everybody there was uh, coming towards cities. It's the beginning of cities and all. A lot of it was uh, nomadic. It was people scattered and all, but cities are becoming a major thing and all. And so Abraham comes from the earth of Chaldees and he, God said, I'm going to build a city. I'm going to make this city and I want you to search for it. But if Abraham would have been mindful, he would have returned back to whence he came, meaning he would have went back to the earth of Chaldees. God has delivered us from this. God has delivered us from this other place, this other plurality of stuff. He's delivered us from that. And he wants us to really focus and be singular on the fact, you know what? I'm not going to be mindful of this stuff. Now think about that term mindful. In other words, my mind is full of all the stuff over here. And if you're not careful, you'll keep, uh, you'll keep, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, eating and consuming all this other stuff until your mind becomes full of it. And when it becomes full of it, you're not careful. You'll return back to it. You'll return back to it. I've always said that wherever my mind goes, my actions and my body ultimately follows. So you know what? I don't want to get my mind on all this or I'll lose faith, lose heart. But I want to look over here and be mindful of this. I want my mind to be filled with the work of God, the kingdom of God. And you know what? We all need to be reminded when Jesus stood before Pilate. You know, we're watching kingdoms and the battle of kingdoms. But the deal is, is Jesus was very clear when he said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. So you know what? I don't want to get so focused on this world. It's what Paul said about Demas. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world more than the world to come. So you know what? It's like Eve at the, at the tree. The Bible says when she saw that it was, it was pleasant to the eye. And so you know what? If you're not careful, your eye will take you somewhere and then, then it will create a desire or lust for this. And then you eat a forbidden fruit and the rest is history. So, you know what? If my eye is going to behold anything, let it behold the work of God. I think that what Revelation talks about, he that hath an ear, let him hear. And I'm also including to the church of Laodicea, you need to get you some eye salve. And you're blind, but you need to be able to see. So I don't want to become blinded to the things of God and can only see the negativity, the evil. Uh, there's, it, it's crazy. It's just crazy right now. But you know what? I don't want to see all of that and not see what God's doing in the earth. So I think it's time for the people of God come together. Honestly, I think it's time for us to come together and quit talking about all the other stuff that's going on. And let's start talking about what is God doing? What is the ultimate go of God in this situation? Where should we be? What should we be doing? If you'll remember a few weeks ago, I talked about the burden of Issachar. So we need God to give us understanding of the times. And we need God to also allow us to know what we ought to be doing. So let's focus on that building. Let's focus on Jesus building the church and not get so distracted by the other building a mystery Babylon and what it's building, but let's, uh, let's be faithful to this again. I'll quote it one more time, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So you know what? Uh, quit looking at all this other stuff. Look over here at Jesus. 
He said, in the midst of all the evil, in the midst of all these deities that they claim, here at the very gates of hell, I'm going to build my church. And you know what? Years ago, God gave me a message. That it's, it's an old message, and I'm, a lot of people have heard it, but uh, God's church in Babylon. It's amazing to me that in Babylon, Simon Peter gives his salutations the church which is at Babylon elected together with you saluteth you and so doth Marcus my son. God could build a church in Babylon. There are saints in Caesar's household. There's a church in Rome. So you know what? If God can do all that and then Jesus stand there at the very gates of hell and proclaim that I'm going to build a church right here. So you know what? If those churches could be built in that culture, that climate, then there's no difference today. Regardless of what's happening out there, the church is destined to be victorious. So you know what? Let's look to something that's good. Let's look to something that uplifts our hearts and full of faith. Uh, God's church is still here on the earth. There's a purpose for it. Let's find that purpose and let's obey and let's do the things that we should do. All right. So which building do you want to look at? Which city do you want to search for? I choose to look uh, to the church, I choose to look to the city that Jesus is building for us. So, all right, uh, I think I'll close there. Hopefully, I've got across my message here tonight, my little Bible study, and uh, that maybe, you know, it will help some of us. Uh, you know, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, you know, the, the psalmist said, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, my foot will not slipped until I went into the house of the Lord and I seen the end thereof. You know, we don't need to be so focused on evil getting by that we lose our faith. We lose our faith. God is the ultimate judge of all things. And every man, every woman is going to stand before him and answer for their life. And the book will be open on their life. So you know what? Uh, I want to get focused on making sure that my name's in the book of life. And I want to make sure that I stay focused on the purpose of God. No, I, 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 I want to take that back. Not on the purpose of God, but on God. Some people can find his purpose, but never find him. So I want to focus on him. I want to look to him. And you know what? He is. He is our blessed hope. All right. God bless you. Thank you for watching tonight, uh, giving us your time. And hopefully this will encourage us to go do the will of God. You know, instead of watching the news so much, get online, find you somebody, teach a Zoom Bible study, uh, find good preaching stuff. YouTube's full of all kinds of preaching by good anointed apostolic men. Feed on that kind of stuff. Amen. And I, I'm telling you, uh, seek ye first the kingdom. Instead of seeking all this other stuff and getting up, I, I mentioned it again today, uh, Brother Terry Shock. And I need to practice this. I haven't mastered it yet. But he said, first thing I do when I get up, I don't check Facebook. I don't look at emails. I don't try to take any kind of news. I give my time. First thing, I give my time to the reading of the word and the time in prayer. So you know what? Seek ye first. Seek ye first. Look to that instead of looking to the other. All right, God bless you. Uh, let's put into practice what I'm talking about here tonight. Abounding grace, let's not get so focused on all this other stuff that we lose hope. But I'm telling you, God has an intent for the end time, and that is for there to be a great Gentile harvest. And I want to be a part of that, and I want you to be a part of it. So let's go forward. I think that 2021 is a year for the church to be seated with him in heavenly places, and that God wants us to take our seat with authority and dominion, which is what it means. I've already overcome. And I'll be talking to you all about that, to he that overcometh. But that's another message. But it is a word from God for this year and for our churches and others out of here. All right. God bless you. Thank you for joining with us. Anything we can do, please don't, uh, please contact us and to let us know. If you ever have a question about the word of God or something, then go to the website. And if you ever want to be baptized or uh, you need some help or whatever, then please contact us. Uh, and we'll be glad to do whatever that we possibly can. All right, God bless you. We love you. Hope you have a great evening tonight. We'll see you on Sunday uh, in the name of the Lord. Amen.